Welcome to another installment of Research in Profile, uh, brought to you by the School of Political Science and International Studies at the University of Queensland. My name is Martin Weber, and I'm here today with my colleague, uh, Professor Catherine Gelber, to talk about her new book that she's edited together with Susan Bryson. Uh, it's called Free Speech in the Digital Age. Um, and we will look forward to hearing from you, Kath, on what the book is about and what um, kind of prompted you guys to do it. Susan and I met at a workshop in Melbourne a number of years ago, and at the time we obviously discovered a mutual interest in the topic, but we were really struck by two things. One was that there was a case going on mm. at the time in the United States in which a man had threatened his wife online, and as part of his defence, he was arguing that the fact that it happened online meant, made it less real and right. that therefore he shouldn't be charged with threatening her because he didn't really mean it, because it was just online and it was just him expressing himself online. So we found that argument unpersuasive, but we found it interesting that it was being launched in the public sphere. And then the other thing that we were struck by was that on the one hand there's a body of literature in freedom of speech mm -hmm. and why freedom of speech is important and what its limits should be. And on the other hand there's a burgeoning literature in the internet and what's happening online and how this is affecting our lives. And those two literatures weren't talking to each other. And so we wanted to put together a collection in which the, the intersection of free speech theory and ideas and what's happening online would come to life. Uh, is it true that you think that the internet has somehow changed how we think of things like uh, free speech um, and the associated kind of problems that that might bring about? For a start, I guess the issue is that we now live our lives online and offline mm. seamlessly. It no longer makes sense to talk about an offline world and an online world. When mm. people commute to work, they might be using a GPS. If they tag on with a card onto mm. the public transport, they're using, they're using another GPS. Yeah. We live our lives in these two worlds simultaneously and it might no longer makes sense to differentiate them. So, so the question that kind of arises from this is how that then leads to a difference between how we perceive issues about speech in particular um, and whether speech is all sorts of different kinds of things in that context as well. And I thought the book was kind of responding to that as well. Yes, so the book is asking whether the way that we traditionally think about free speech, mm -hmm. which ranges from the arguments that we use to defend it to the ways in which we recognise that speech can harm, has this changed mm. in the digital age? And we, I guess, conclude that in some ways it has and in some ways it hasn't. Mm. So it has changed in the sense that the internet facilitates new mechanisms of harm and a new scope of harm that weren't available pre-internet. Mm. So, for example, easy examples are revenge porn or cyber stalking or doxing, putting out personal documents from somebody without their mm. consent, um, and some forms of hate speech have been really enlivened and facilitated by the internet. On the other hand, the fact that speech takes place online doesn't change the... So the core of our argument is that it doesn't change the fact that speech is a type of conduct. Speech mm. is what we do in the world. And it actually re-raises the question of sp is speech more akin to thought or is speech more akin to conduct? And Susan and I are both of the view that speech is akin to conduct, it's a type of conduct, mm -hmm. and that with your speech you do things in the world. And when you're doing those things online, you're still doing things in the world. People have until now had a tendency to think, well, it's happening in cyberspace, so it's not mm -hmm. happening in the real world. But cyberspace is the real world. Mm -hmm. It's where we conduct a great proportion of our lives People don't really have a choice not to be on it. So one of the traditional responses to speech you don't like is, well, just avert your eyes. Mm. You can't avert your no. eyes from the internet. Yeah. It's an integral part yeah. of the world in which we live. And so we have to manage better the way in which we communicate online. So it's one of the upshots of the arguments in the book that there must be new types of regulation in dealing with uh, questions of transgressions that might be happening as a result of what we then would call abuse of free speech. Indeed. Well, we have conflicting views in the mm -hmm. book. So mm -hmm. some of the people in the book are very much of the view that it's, if you give governments greater ability to regulate the speech in the online sphere, they're going to do it badly. Mm. We have a chapter by Dinah Pokempner, who's, uh, yeah. who's General Counsel for Human Rights Watch, who points out that in country after country after country where governments have tried to do this kind of regulation, they've done it very badly. Mm. They tend to use regulation to protect themselves from dissent, which is not really the purpose of mm. that kind of regulation. And so we really need to be careful to protect human rights, that we don't give governments too mm. much power to regulate when they do it badly. On the other hand, there are some very specific things 
that should be regulated, in my opinion, and in the opinion of some of the other authors in this book, things like revenge porn. Mm. Um, we need to rethink the immunity from liability of uh, internet service providers yeah. who, particularly in the United States under federal communications law there, are immune from liability for any content that their users uphold. Mm. Now, on the face of it, that sounds sensible, but when you delve more deeply into it, and in, the, in a world where the distinction between a platform and a user and who actually is distributing the content gets blurred, we might need to rethink some of those principles as well. Excellent. So you were talking about um, the new types of harm that are coming about in that context. Um, and maybe, I mean, the mention of revenge porn and things like that seems to be an obvious instance of that. Um, when you go to questions such as what happens with teenagers in schools and everything else, is there anything that the book picks up uh, with regard to those um, issues about the kind of people who are exposed to the harm and whether there are different segments of the population that are more or less exposed to that harm? Is that part of the topic? Yes, it is. So one of the things that uh, one of the chapters in here talks about the um, Barlow Declaration, mm -hmm. which was issued in 1996, which declared that the internet is the home of the mind, and it literally said this is a, not a place where bodies live. And the author of that chapter says, oh, yes, it is a place where bodies live, and in particular, the types of bodies who are harmed most through harmful speech on the internet are the already marginalised mm -hmm. women, gays and les LBG LGBTIQ folk, and so on. So the internet can reinforce existing patterns of discrimination and marginalisation that exist in the offline world, mm. and they can also facilitate new methods of marginalisation and discrimination that occur online. And then, there's, then added to that, there's the, another chapter in here about algorithms and how because the algorithms are written by particular types of people who dominate the yep. Silicon Valley employment market, which on the whole, to stereotype, and of course there are exceptions, on the whole means young white men, yep. the way in which the algorithms operate entrenches discrimination mm -hmm. that the algorithm writers are unaware of. And so we have a manifestation, an accumulation of disadvantage and marginalisation through the supposedly neutral algorithms that mm. run how we, uh, how we access and how we experience the internet. That's a really interesting thought that may seem to raise the issue that perhaps uh, what the internet is doing is actually amplify certain tendencies and problems that we already have had and talked about in kind of broader societies um, uh, for a long time about exclusions from public spheres and all that. Is that something that the book picks up on? Is there people who kind of make this argument? Yes. So we have, for example, Soraya Chamali, who mm -hmm. runs the uh, Women's Media Centre in the United States, who's one of the authors in this book. We also have Danielle Keats Citron, mm -hmm. Citron, who wrote a wonderful book called Crimes in Cyberspace, where she details some of the very difficult situations that individuals have faced and the fact that for a long time when people would go, for example, to the police and saying I'm being threatened or I'm mm. being, I've been chucked out of my law class or somebody's put these uh, documents online without my knowledge, for a long time police had the view, well, we can't really do anything mm. about that. Yeah. That doesn't fall into our traditional categories of how mm. we understand abuse or threat or domestic violence. That is changing now thanks mm -hmm. to the work of people like Daniel Keats Citron, Soraya Chamali and Marianne Franks who all feature in this book. I think that a lot of our viewers will find this really interesting and will find this a good hook to actually think about the issues that are being raised. Um, and we can only commend to you to read this, um, go with it, have a look at all the different contributions. It's a highly relevant volume um, and will, I think, set the terms of debate in this space for years to come. Um, thank you very much, Kath. Thank you. And let's hope we'll have another chat about this soon. Thank you.